Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm an alcoholic. So I'm going to start. I just have to tell the truth. You know, I, I, I first want to start by thanking every single person involved with this, every, every beautiful soul who put together this event, every single person who got up to this podium, who stood at the microphone, who shared their heart, who allowed my heart to open wide, because I came here completely broken, suffering internally, not knowing what was wrong with me, feeling completely isolated and disconnected at 11 years sober, not even knowing how badly I needed this until I walked in the door and I heard the first person open their mouth and share the truth. So thank you, every single person who walked up to me and cried with me and talked to me or shared their heart with me because you have no idea what you have done for me. You know, I... I, I have to start off by telling the truth because I, I got in this place many years ago where I wanted to present this persona in Alcoholics Anonymous. I want to be Miss AA. I want to show the world that I'm doing this right. I, you know, and I, I go to meetings and I pretend I have everything okay and inside I'm dying. And I can't tell you that. I can't tell you that because what will you think of me? You know, I'm not walking on water and I, I'm not floating on air and I'm suffering internally. I'm in pain. I wake up in the morning on a def default setting of terror. Like something awful is going to happen to me. I'm going to lose someone. I'm going to lose something. And this is how I'm waking up every day. And I can't tell you that because I'm supposed to be the light in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm supposed to tell you that there's, this is so much hope and it's joy. And there is joy. I'm not saying there isn't. But the problem is, is when I hide the pain, I can't experience that joy. And I'm walking around a numb and I'm like avoiding meetings and I'm avoiding people. And I'm avoiding this inventory, this massive inventory that I'm in the middle of writing because I'm in pain and I don't want to see why. I don't want to see why. I don't want to see the truth because, because I'm afraid and I come here and the truth is everywhere and I can't hide from it. And I have this moment of surrender where I, I need more help. I will always need more help and I need you. I need you desperately and I need more God all the time. All the time I need more God. And I'm telling you, like, if you had told me, you know, like, a decade or so ago that I was going to be traveling across the country to talk to you about my relationship with God, I would have laughed directly in your face. There was never a story like that I ever believed that I would have a relationship with God. And not only would I have a relationship with God, but I would want to shout about it from the rooftops. That was not, that was not in my, you know, plans. That just wasn't. And Alcoholics Anonymous was not in the plan. It was not something I was interested in. I didn't want anything to do with your program. I didn't want anything to do with a relationship with God. I didn't want a spiritual solution. I wanted the solution to my problem to be anything but spiritual. I wanted it to be a man. I wanted it to be money. I brought a couple kids into this world thinking they were going to be the solution. That's what I wanted. You know, I wanted it to be a, you know, a pill or a shot or anything other than this, anything other than God. And believe me, I sought them all out. I sought all these other solutions out, and none of them worked. They left me hollow and empty. That same feeling of disconnect and hollowness and emptiness that I felt from the time I was a little child. And then I come in here and I, I start to have this experience and I feel that thing that's been missing all these years, that connection. You know, and, and it was, and you guys gave that to me. You guys showed me the way. And, um, you know, I can't, I, you know, looking back now, I can't believe I fought this for so long. You know, I, I suffered seeking this connection. I, I've been seeking my whole life. I've been seeking God my whole life. There was never a lack of God in my life. Uh, it, you know, as a child, you know, my father, he's a retired Presbyterian minister, so I'm not the person who was ever brought up. Like, I, I knew what God was. There was a very real conception of God presented to me as a child, and this was the conception that I was supposed to, you know, believe in and abide by, and that conception was something I rejected immediately. It didn't work for me. Because I walk around this life, and, you know, even as a little girl, I just feel different. I feel off. 
I feel lonely. I, I just like, you're never going to like me. I'm constantly obsessed with what you think about me and I'm alone and I'm afraid all the time and I can never measure up. I have six brothers and sisters who are amazing human beings and I'm never going to be as good as they are. You know, I, you know, my mom and dad don't love me. Like all of these stories I tell myself in my head and I, you know, I go to this church every Sunday and I hear a story about this God up in the sky. At least that's how I hear it. I'm not sure that's what was really being told. I'm never sure of my own thoughts and my memories, by the way. And um, I hear this story that, like, there's this God, and if you're a good little girl, you go to this magical place in the sky where all these clouds and you get all these wonderful things. And if you're a bad little girl, you go to this fiery pit, and I'm a liar by the time I'm five, so I already know where I'm going. I already know that's where I'm ending up because, like, I have to lie constantly to get you to like me because there's no way you're going to love me if you knew who I really am. There's just no way. So I'm lying. I remember doing weird stuff as a kid. Like, I remember I forged, like, I, I'm old. I had, you know, Thriller album cover. I, like, it had Michael Jackson's signature on it. And I forged, like, I traced the name and I brought it to school. And I was like, look, I got his autograph. Like, this is the kind of stuff I would do because I just wanted you to love and accept me. I create these characters and these, you know, these stage characters as, at a very young age because I, I want to fit in. I want to connect and I can't. And this idea of God that I'm being presented with won't, won't work for, for someone like that. It won't work for somebody who's afraid all the time, who doesn't have faith, who doesn't tell the truth. Like, it's never going to, it's not going to work for me. So I reject that immediately. And, um, and I walk around suffering. Walk around suffering as a teenager. Walk around seeking a solution outside of myself, seeking anything to make me feel better about being in my skin. And then something happens to me when I'm 15 years old and I experience this trauma at the hands of these three men and my, and my mother. You know, her reaction and response to it was, you know, shame. It was shame. Like, how could you, how could you do this? You, how could you be so stupid kind of thing? You know? And that was it for me. I didn't even want to live anymore after that. I was already full of rage and fear and anger, but that was it. Like, I didn't trust anybody in the world, and there was no place in this world for me, nowhere where I belonged, nowhere where I could, wouldn't, wasn't going to be afraid. And then I picked up a drink. And alcohol did for me what I could never do for myself. And I was free. For the first time in my entire life, I didn't care if you liked me. I didn't care if I fit in anymore. In fact, I believed I fit in. Immediately when I put that, that, you know, I, I realized the effect that alcohol could produce for me. Now, I'm not sure. Like, I'm pretty sure I had a drink here and there prior to this. But after that happened, I picked up that drink and I, I, I experienced the effect produced by alcohol. And I was okay. I was okay. I could talk to you. I could interact with you. That feeling of connection that had been missing my whole life was right there in that moment, and I felt it. And I did not want to be separated from this for the next 20-plus years. You know, and I can't, like, I can't tell you that I started off a daily drinker, but I will tell you this. I was an abnormal drinker from day one. You know, it, the... <laughs> The book says that many of us started out as moderate or hard drinkers, and I, I, I believe I kind of skipped over the moderate part, and I don't say that because I'm real tough or anything. I say that because, you know, the book says that a moderate drinker, you know, can basically stop. Like, they can leave it alone with little, prob little trouble, and that's just not my truth. That's not my story, you know, because... By the time I'm 19 years old and I'm drinking, you know, as much as I, I can, I get pregnant. And, um, and what separates me from normal people like my sisters is that entire pregnancy. I stop. I stop for that pregnancy. But I didn't do it out of any sense of virtue. I was, you know, it's apparently sitting uh, on a bar stool when you're pregnant is a really bad look. And um, <laughs> I really really want to, you know, I'm really obsessed with what everybody thinks of me. So I stopped drinking because of that, because I don't want anybody to look down on me. And, but what separates me is like my sisters, when they're pregnant, you know, what they're doing, they're picking out baby names, they're nesting. I think that's what good mothers call it. Like, you know, they're doing things to prepare for this child. And what I'm doing is I'm counting the days, like this is a prison sentence, till I can get this kid out of my body and I can get loaded again. 
And that's exactly what I do. The second my daughter is born, I'm off to the races again, and I'll, you know, and I'm, I'm a day drinker. And, and, and you know, I convince myself I'm this amazing mother when I can't, I can't even do anything for her unless I'm loaded. I, I wake up in the morning and prop her up with a bottle, and I don't want to be bothered. And um, yeah, I remember, um, you know, I, I tried to be a mother for for three years, and you know, I lost custody of her when um, she was three years old. And on the outside, I did what every single mother I thought was supposed to do, and it was kick and scream. And, you know, I think I tried to run them over in the parking lot of the courthouse and, um, you know, all this messy stuff. But if I, were to, if, if I would have told you the truth, if I had even known the truth at that point, I would have told you that I was relieved. I didn't want to be a mother. I didn't want to take care of my daughter. She was in the way of my drinking, and when she wasn't under my roof anymore, and I didn't have to take care of a three-year-old, I could drink exactly how I wanted to, and she was gone, and I missed her, and I loved her as much as I was capable of loving someone, but I didn't want that responsibility. And the shame that follows that is, is overwhelming, because I believe, like, inherently, I'm evil, and I'm bad, and there's something wrong with me, because this is how I view my children. I don't care about them. They are disposable. You know, and as my disease progresses, and it did start out fun, and it was a party until it wasn't anymore. You know, it's those, the, those imaginary lines we cross. Like, I, I drink, and it's a party, and it's fun, and then very slowly alcohol becomes my master, and I don't realize it. It's dictating everything I do. You know, where I live, I move to Manhattan because the bars stay open until 5 a.m., you know, I can drink longer. I, every, every job I ever take is centered around, you know, alcohol. Like, I, I work in the restaurant and bar industry. You know, so I can go to work loaded and nobody cares. And if I get fired from that job, I'll just find another one. And it's cash basis. So, you know, I'm good to go every single night. And every relationship I have is, is all about drugs and alcohol and other substances. And it's like, you know, if anybody ever tells me, you know, you need to slow down or moderate or stop, I'm out. Or if you don't give me the money I need to drink the way I want to drink or, you know, any of those things, I, I leave and I move on to the next one. And there's always a next one. You know, I probably have multiple at a time because I'm so terrified of being alone. And, you know, every relationship I have is transactional. Like, what can you do for me? What can you do for me? And, you know, once you cease to be of use for me, I just move on to the next one. And as it progresses, like, this party starts to fade and it turns into this full-time job where I need to drink. And everything I, everything I do is, like, about getting alcohol and getting more alcohol. And then slowly, you know, as the disease progresses and I'm on my second marriage... And I, you know, I'm pregnant with my second child. It turns into a nightmare. Because I get pregnant with my second child. And I wasn't able to stop. And I didn't want to stop. Not for one second. I had no connection to the child I was carrying. None whatsoever. I, uh, I drank the entire pregnancy. And I gave birth to uh, a two-pound baby. And he was three months premature. And, um, you know, I, I remember the first time I laid eyes on my son... Um, he was in the NICU and he was on life support and I and in that moment I looked at him and in that moment I, I felt all the love that had been missing during that pregnancy again I loved him as much as I was capable of loving any human being but what came with that love was this overwhelming sense of shame and guilt because I did this I put him there he can't breathe because of me he can't be held because of me I did this to him and nothing will take away that shame but alcohol. And even then, it's not producing the same effect. I need more, and I need more, and I need more. And I believe what our book says. You know, it says it over and over again. You know, many of us had moral and philosophical convictions galore, but we could not live up to them even though we would like to. You know, we could wish to be moral. We could wish to be philosophically comforted. We could will these things all with all our might. The needed power was not there because this is how I show up. Even wanting to be a good mother, wanting to be a good wife, wanting to be a good daughter, sister, all of these things, I don't have the power to do it because the kind of mother I am, I will not out and drop my son on the floor I will leave my child in a hot car in a terrible neighborhood, walk around the corner to get a drink and not, not concerned about his safety or his well-being. And I am the kind of mother who, when my son is eight months old, I get arrested with him in the car. And my husband has to drive to the police station and he has to pick up his baby until I get bailed out the next morning and I come home. And he's in the living room and packed up and he's, he's going to leave He's going to leave and he's going to take my son and I do everything I can. I beg and I plead and I promise, I promise. 
And you know what? The insane part is I believe every single one of these promises that are coming out of my mouth. I will do anything. Please do not leave me. I am begging you. I will do anything you ask me to do. Do not leave me. Do not take my son. Don't do this to me. And he stops and he says, okay, I'll stay on one condition. You go to treatment today. You get sober today. And I looked at that man and I looked at my little boy and I knew he was going to leave. And I said, no. I said, no. That's what my head tells me is, you know what? You'll get him back tomorrow. You'll figure it out tomorrow. He'll come back. He's not really going to leave you. But I need a drink now. I need a drink more than I need my husband, more than I need my child. I need a drink more than I need to breathe. And that is the power alcohol has over me. That is the grip alcohol has on me. And so for years, years and years, I drink and I drink because, you know, I'm consumed with this shame and this, this false belief that I'm this horrible human being, that I'm a scumbag who's beyond saving, who's beyond any of this like freedom that you all experience here. I remember coming in and out of the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and seeing all you happy, joyous, and free people. And I hated every single one of you because you all had something that I would never have. And that was forgiveness, redemption. That wasn't available to me. That was never going to be available to me because I chose this, right? I chose alcohol over my mom and my dad and my sisters and my marriages and my, my jobs and my homes. And I chose alcohol over my children. And that's what I believe with every fiber of my being. So why would that, a scumbag like me who chooses alcohol over these amazing human beings, why would I be worthy of that? And it wasn't until a woman in AA opened up that big book and explained to me that for reasons yet obscure, most alcoholics have lost the power of choice when it comes to a drink, that I began to be set free just a little bit. So the first time in my entire life when I saw that in black and white, I knew, I knew I wasn't just a scumbag who was beyond saving, who was beyond redemption, who was beyond forgiveness, that I was an alcoholic. And alcohol has that much power over me and that I need to find a power that much bigger than alcohol. And I would love to tell you I got there in that moment that my husband was walking out the door and taking my child was enough to get me to stop, but it was not. I would love to tell you ending up on life support was enough to get me to stop, but it wasn't. I would love to tell you that the 11 felonies that I racked up in my act of drinking was enough to get me to stop losing custody of both children, losing everything, every material possession I ever had, but none of that, none of the outside consequences were enough to get me to stop. And, and by the way, none of these outside consequences have anything to do with me, my alcoholism. It's just what happened. That what happened when I drink, and the only reason I talk about it is to illustrate just the, the power that alcohol can have. That I will choose, that I, I, that alcohol will consume me. It will truly be my master until I found a, find a power big enough. And you know, I, I stumble in and out of the rooms of AA for so many years, and I, and I don't know what's wrong with me. I think I'm choosing this, and I, 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 I hear this message that maybe if I just go to a bunch of meetings and, you know, I, I do all this external stuff, and I, I don't hear the message. And I, it's not because people weren't talking about it. I've had the most incredible messengers for years, people planting seeds over and over and over again, and I just couldn't hear it, and I, I couldn't hear what you were talking about. I thought... If you separated me from alcohol, I was going to be okay. And that's all I needed to do is be separated from alcohol. The problem with this is time and time again, I keep getting separated from alcohol. Various different things will separate me from alcohol. Um, I found law enforcement does a very good job of separating me from alcohol. Like once I'm locked up behind bars, I have very little access to it. So I keep getting separated from it. And I end up in these places and these detoxes and these jails and, or maybe even white knuckling it on, you know, at home with a, you know, do, trying it for the, the kids or the relationship. And, and I can't. There will come a day when it becomes so unbearable being in my skin that the only thing I could think of is I need the relief of a drink again. And it doesn't matter what the consequences look like. It doesn't matter that I know I'm losing that job or I know he's walking out the door or I know that I'm supposed to be at court tomorrow because I'm going to lose custody of my son if I don't show up. And I drink anyway and I can't. 
That's what keeps, keeps happening over and over again. So I didn't know that the mere separation from alcohol was never going to be enough for me. But something happened. Something happened to me and you know, on May 2nd of 2012 that I was not expecting, that I was not seeking, that I was not looking for. You know, I had come in and out of the rooms of AA for so many years and you know, I absolutely love the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous and my favorite tradition is the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop. But if I'm telling the truth, I, I didn't have that honest desire to stop ever. I had an honest desire for consequences to stop. That's it. That's it. Like, let me come here, let me fix up the outside, and let me stop these consequences. But I didn't want to stop drinking because it was my only solution. It was the only thing that I knew that relieved me of the pain of being me. And why would I want to let go of that, right? So I come in and out for years, and I don't have an honest desire. But on May second, two thousand twelve, something happened to me, and I had I had been on you know a run for about you know maybe a month and a half with the whatever guy I was living with, who I picked up in a recovery house, you know, and uh, <laughs> and the funny thing about this is every other run I ever had, by the end of it, I had nothing. Nothing. I had no material possessions and, you know, maybe a backpack and I was couch hopping and, uh, you know, and I, I, but this one, the outside wasn't that bad. I had a roof over my head. I had a car. I had money in my pocket. And I wanted to die. And I remember that last night, May 2nd of 2012, I'm on the highway at 4 o'clock in the morning and I'm driving to go get a drink. And I, all of a sudden something happens to me and I have this overwhelming and overpowering desire to turn my car around and go home and stop doing what I'm doing. And I can't do it. No matter how bad I want to go home and stop lying to my children and lying to my family and hurting everybody I love, I cannot turn my car around. And so for the first time in my life, I, start, I cry out to a power I don't actually believe in, and I certainly don't think this power cares about me. And I'm not saying that I hadn't prayed up until this point, because I have. I've prayed my whole life. Dear God, please make the judge in a good mood. Dear God, get me $20. Dear God, like, fix this relationship. Like, fix the outside. Here's my will, God. Do this for me. That's what I prayed my whole life. Like, God, some Santa Claus. And, and the second God doesn't do my will for me, I, I'm assuming... Wrongly, so that God just doesn't exist, or he doesn't care about me. But that night, I was so desperate, and I was so broken, that I scream out to God, and there was a lot of cursing, and you know, it's a family conference, and I'll keep it out of it, but it was, dear God, just effing kill me or stop me. Please, pounding on the steering wheel, begging God to kill me or stop me, because I couldn't do it anymore. And I drank. I couldn't turn the car around, but I got locked up 12 hours later. Now again, I don't know how God shows up in your life, but... God has no problem showing up as law enforcement in mine. And uh, <laughs> it was so effective. And I want to stand up here and I want to tell you that in that moment, you know, I, in that gift of desperation, I have this psychic change and everything turns around and I'm okay. And that's, a, that's not what happened. What happened is, you know, 48 hours later, when I realize I'm not getting the cushy detox bed and I'm getting the jail cell and I'm getting consequences and I'm, you know, I had 11 felonies up to that point and I got locked up on a summary retail theft. So I thought this little minor charge was just going to get me a little dry out phase and I was going to get out in a couple months and that's absolutely not what happened. You know, I end up in this prison cell and I'm like, kind of like, wait, this isn't the deal I was looking for God. It was like, you know, separate me from alcohol, but not like this. And, um, you know, after a couple of days of sitting in that cell, I'm, I'm panicked again, and, and my ego has taken hold of me again. And I pick up that phone, and I call every single human power that I've been lying to and manipulating for years and who has been pulling me out of this mess for so long, and one by one, every single one of them hung up on me. And thank God. Thank God. And I thought this little, you know, was going to be this short, you know, month in jail turned into a judge sentencing me to one to three years to the state correctional facility. And I could tell you what 18 months of incarceration with no spiritual or chemical solution looks like. And I see it in hindsight, by the way. I couldn't see it when I was in it, you know. Uh, this is what Sarah looks like when I have no solution at all in my life. I call home on a phone account that my, my parents are paying for, and I tell my parents what they need to do for me. You should probably go pick up my stuff that I left over here and all this other stuff, you know, m making demands on all the people in my life. Or... I'm writing really long apology letters home about how sorry I am. But maybe if you were better parents or siblings, I wouldn't be here. P.S. Send me money. 
the end. Like that's, that's what I bring to the table when I don't have a solution. And, um, and I get out after 18 months and I think, um, I think I know how to manage my life. That's the insanity. That's the insidiousness of this disease. My ego will create this persona, thinks like, I, I've got this. I mean, it, the insane part is like, I have nothing, and I still think I know what I'm doing. And uh, I get out, and within a couple days of me being home, every, every external solution that I had thought of was stripped out from underneath me, and I was left with nothing. No job, no money, no boyfriend. My family's not talking to me. And I'm curled up in, the, in a ball on, on the floor of a bathroom in a recovery house, crying out to this God all over again, a God I don't necessarily believe in, or I certainly don't think cares about me. But I'm screaming out to this God, what is wrong with me and what am I supposed to do now? Because I haven't put anything in my body. I haven't had a drink in 18 months and I want to die. Sober should not feel like this. And God answered my prayers when I was directed up the steps of my old home group, the Greater Northeast Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. That place saved my life. And I walked into that room and something happened where I saw God for the first time in the eyes of a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, I'm looking for God everywhere my whole life, and I don't know that I'm looking for God in, in the sky, in a relationship, in money, in a bottle, all these other places, and God was sitting right in front of me, and I had missed it this whole time because all the people I had seen in AA that were happy, joy and, joyous, and free, I didn't know you. I thought you were liars. <laughs> like, how do I know how you drank? You're just telling me. Like, I didn't, I always separate myself. Like, oh, my story's worse than yours, or, you know, I, you're not like me in some way, but the people put, God put in my life, in my past, at this time who were sitting in front of me were people I drank with who I knew were just like me just as broken as me and they were sober and they were lit up from within and their whole deportment shouted they had a solution they had an answer for me and I can't even tell you that I was sold that this was going to work for me because I still come in thinking I am lower than you. The things I have done are worse than you, and this freedom and the redemption is not available to me. But something happened in me where I was out of ideas. I had tried every other solution, and I was willing to try yours. Maybe, just maybe, something was going on here, and maybe, just maybe, it would work for a lowlife like me. And I asked the woman to help me, and she took me through the steps, and everything about it was painful and uncomfortable. Like, everything. I, you know, I was that... I was that from, brought up in that family that we prayed in public. So I had this weird shame around like public prayer. And this was a really hard thing for me to overcome. Like I remember like in, when we were little in McDonald's, my mom would like, we would, they would make us hold hands around the dinner table. I see that now today, by the way, it makes me want to cry because I think it's absolutely beautiful. But I couldn't see that back then. I couldn't see that my family was trying to instill these things. All I see is like, you think we're weird, right? You think we're in a cult, you think that. And so I remember I get to my third step prayer and I know I've heard these amazing stories like about people's third step experiences, how they, they got on their knees and they, they, the heavens open up, and like I've heard a, some beautiful stories this weekend, and uh, that's not mine. Like <laughs> I remember getting on my knees and feeling so embarrassed that I'm holding her hand, and there's other people, like there's women in the room, and you know they're arguing about cigarettes, and they're looking at me, and I'm, I am making the most important decision of my entire life, and I miss the moment because I'm so consumed with me. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know I'm making this contract. And so my third step experience has evolved over time because when I come in, this is all it is. I get up from that prayer that I don't even remember the words to. And a, she, this woman slides paper in front of me and she tells me to start to write because it's in black and white. If you turn that page over, this, this decision could have little permanent effect unless it, you know, at once followed by this strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things that are blocking us, right? And that's what I did. And I had that experience. And, you know, the longer I've stayed sober, I've had to realize that it's so much deeper than that. It, it literally says we had to quit playing God. And I can't even tell you how much I love playing God. And I can't even tell you how much suffering that has cost me. Sober. You know, there's, there's, it tells us this is what we do. We quit playing God. But in the beginning, you know what? That's what I did. I quit playing God by allowing this woman to guide me through the 12 steps because I didn't have anything left. I, I didn't try to figure out a way to lie to her. I actually wrote the truth down, or at least the truth to the best of my ability at that point. I quit playing God by putting pen to paper because I had been previously unwilling to do this. And I wrote the truth in a, 
you know, she kind of set me up. She told me to write just the first two columns. And you, you get to write, uh, when it came to resentments, she said, you get to write everybody you're angry at. And I went to town, 27 pages. That poor woman. Because this is how I show up to AA. It's you and what you did to me. That's all I've got. That's all I've got. And, uh, and you know, I sit and I have this experience with her in the fifth step. And, um, you know, I, I, you know, again, we get promises all over the book. And some of them after that fifth step are just incredible. You, can, you know, we feel the nearness of our creator. We can look the world in the eye again. And again, that was not my initial experience. I felt worse. But what did happen was this. I sat with that woman for hours where she pointed out, she, she helped me see this from an entirely new angle. You know, as we, we worked our way to those, you know, third and fourth columns. And uh, I remember, for instance, my mother. My mother got a page to herself. Anyone else have a mom who made them an alcoholic? Because mine sure did. Everything bad that happened in my life was because of my mother. And it started with that moment, maybe, probably before. You know, I, I, I initially, you know, I've written so much inventory sober. But, like, you know, I have to keep going deeper. But, like, I thought it was in that moment where, you know, at 15 years old, like, that was her reaction to what had happened to me. So, you know, this is my first inventory, and it's my mom, and she gets this page. It's all her. And as I walk with this woman to that fourth column and we have this conversation, not only do I realize how self-seeking and dishonest and, frankly, what a monster I've been to this woman my whole life, I see the truth, which is this. I took this one thing my mother did when I was 15 years old, and I allowed it to blind me to every beautiful thing my mother did for me my whole life. Every time she was showing up at detox with a fresh bag of clothes or inviting me to family dinner when nobody else in the family wanted to talk to me. My mother's always loved me unconditionally. And I can't see that. I can't see the truth through my resentment. I can't see you and I can't feel God. And I see that in black and white and I look at this and I see all these resentments and fears and the conduct. This is how I behave in relationships. And I don't want to be that person anymore. This is not who I want to be. So when I get to six and seven initially, listen, I wasn't clinging to anything. You know, I come in, the bar is so loud. You know, I'm a burglar. I've never, you know, been faithful in a relationship. Every single defect of character I have is causing me a massive consequence. So absolutely God can take every single one of these things. Absolutely. Take everything. 11 years sober? No. <laughs> I, lo I really love judging. I really love my justified anger. Oh, my God, it's my favorite. Get me on Twitter arguing one day. And it's just like, you know, one of these things, like I love feeling superior, all of these things. At, the longer I stay sober, the more difficult it, it is to let go of these things because I think they work for me. And, I, and sometimes I won't go to God with these things until I'm suffering. I'm going to hold on to them. Because I'm agnostic, because I believe God can't do things for me. And, um, but coming in, I'm so broken, and I'm like, you can have all of me. Just take all of this. And, the, and thank God I had that experience before I went out into the world for that vital night step where, you know, um, I sat in front of all the people that I had hurt, and, and for the first time in my life, I didn't say that I was sorry. I said that I was wrong, and I admitted the things that I did to people because I'm that gaslighter. I'm that person who's like, you did not see me steal the $20 from your purse. What are you, crazy? Like, that was somebody else's hand. Like, I will tell you. I don't care if you saw it with your own eyes. You heard it with your own ears. I didn't do that. What are you talking about? And I told these people the truth, and I, I, I gave them an opportunity to share with, share with me what I, you know, how I hurt them. And I asked what I could do to make that right. And, um, you know, coming in like I, I see God within you. And uh, when I got to that ninth step, I started to feel something different, that, that God within me, that fundamental idea of God that is deep down within every man, woman, and child, that fundamental idea of God that I've been seeking my whole life that I thought was out here was in here. And I start to feel that, and I start to experience promises that you guys were talking about that I didn't think I could ever experience, extra promises I believe to be extravagant, because you're telling me that you're going to, you know, a, a woman who's lived her entire life crippled with fear and who couldn't do anything with her life is going to know a new freedom and a new happiness, and I'm not going to regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. Like, I remember by the time I got to my 12th step, everything kind of clicked into place and became everything. It just came full circle, because all of those things that I came in here with all of those vile disgusting things that I come in here with that I think I can never be forgiven for like abandoning my children and you know all the disgusting things I did God transforms them and his 
made them my most useful tools here in Alcoholics Anonymous. So when a woman comes to me and she tells me she drank her whole pregnancy or she left her kid in the car, instead of looking down on her in judgment, I can look at her in the eye with love and I can say, I, I did that too, me too. And that's what happens. And I start to have this experience and I'm on fire for Alcoholics Anonymous. And then there's life. You know, <laughs> I come in here and I got promised a life beyond my wildest dreams. And my definition of a life beyond my wildest dreams is, uh, you know, six-figure income, really hot boyfriend, all of those things. I have neither, by the way. Uh, like, that's not, like, and, and what happened is, through doing this work over and over again, by the way, I'm like have to consistently go through the steps because, you know, I'm, you know, that level alcoholic and uh, it's necessary for me. But, um, you know, I, I, my idea of what a life beyond my wildest dreams has been completely transformed in the last decade of my sobriety. You know, there were, there were things that, um, gifts that I've experienced sober that I would have never thought would be gifts. Like coming up on four years sober, I got a phone call from my mother telling me that my oldest sister was dead. And in, in that moment, like having that, that promise of intuitively knowing how to handle a situation that used to baffle me, intuitively knowing, <laughs> intuitively knowing that this was about helping my parents bury their child, about helping her children bury their mother, and this wasn't about me. Thanks. I got this gift. God gives me this gift. I remember arriving at the funeral home and uh, being so terrified. I'm going to walk in here. I'm going to see my sister in a casket, right? And I'm like, I, I just ask God, please hold me through this. Like, show me where I'm supposed to be. You know, this idea, like, that we are supposed to be of maximum service to God and the people around us. Like, this is where we are supposed to be. And I know God placed me here for that reason because I walk in and it's just me and my daughter and my mom and my dad and my mom and my dad see their firstborn daughter in the casket for the first time. And I get to be there and I get to hold my mom. And I I get to comfort her, the woman I had my greatest resentment towards. And not only that, that beautiful soul that was in the casket, like that, my sister, I had the last year and I had that year and a half of her life with the most beautiful relationship we had ever had because of the immense process. And I get to carry that with me for the rest of my life. Because if I hadn't done this work, if I hadn't had this experience, if I don't have a relationship with God, or, you know, if I haven't done these things, I'm in the bathroom and I'm hiding. I run because I'm afraid. And I make it about me. And I can't show up for anybody else. And God gives me this gift. You know, I don't know what spirituality like looks like for everybody, but I had to learn that spirituality, you know, there's these beautiful gifts that we get, like being here. Like I wake up and I feel God everywhere. I walk outside and I look at those mountains and that spirituality, like I feel the presence of my creator, but then there's that spirituality being in the most painful, awful thing you could possibly imagine and being okay. And experiencing that peace, that peace that passes all understanding. That is God. For me, like that was where I met God. Like that's where I truly started to experience this. And I, you know, um, my younger brother, um, you know, I, I know it sounds like I kind of skipped over steps 10 and 11 when I st was doing this talk, and uh, <laughs> because I did. <laughs> when I first went through the steps, I absolutely did. I mean, I got a 10-step buddy when I don't know what that is, but apparently it was supposed to call a woman from another recovery house every day and talk to her about, you know, fear, resentment, all of these things. All I did was call her who, about who I was resentful towards, and I never, like, got into any solution. It was just a, you know, let's complain to each other, right? And thank God I've gone through my steps more than once, and I have a true understanding of what steps 10 and 11 mean, because without them, I don't think I'd be standing here. You know, I, I had to go through my steps again at uh, eight years sober during COVID and, you know, because the wreckage that I was causing others sober, um, you know, and the disconnect I was feeling from God was unbearable. And uh, it's been since that experience of, like, ending up with 26 horrible, like, sober amends at eight years sober that I have not stepped away from these disciplines of 10 and 11. And, um, you know, this continue to watch for 
watching my thoughts, watching, you know, and, and, you know, doing this work to have a relationship with God and cleaning them up. So um, a few months ago, I had an argument with my, I had an argument with my little brother, and uh, it's funny because we were not arguing about anything that had to do with the two of us. We were arguing about my other brother's marriage, so it, it was, it was ridiculous. And um, so we're having this argument, and my brother, he's making these little snide remarks to me, and, you know, and I'm showing up as like, hi, I'm, yes, I'm Miss Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm not going to react to that. And I think I'm keeping my side of the street clean, right? And uh, finally, my brother says something to me, and he said, well, why don't you tell me what you really think? Okay. <laughs> Let's go. And I say it in the most calm and loving and Miss Alcoholics Anonymous way. You know, Benjamin, it's time for you to start taking accountability for your life. And it's time for you to stop blaming mom and dad for your problems. And uh, my brother screamed at me. He was furious. And he hung up on me. He said, I'll never speak to you again. And he hung up and he blocked my number. And so I had this like feeling, and I, it's, I, it might have been Erica or somebody was talking about this, this feeling that just something was off when I got off that phone call. Like I didn't really think I did anything wrong in my head, but my heart didn't feel right. The conversation did not sit right with me. So I picked up the phone and I, you know, I, I, I did what we're told to do, discuss this. I call my sponsor and I have this hour-long conversation with my sponsor and I'm kind of, my ego is pushing against this. But what comes through this beautiful 10-step process is that, you know, that isn't him and this isn't me. This is our egos butting up against each other and, you know, we love each other and this isn't us. And I'm afraid. And I'm afraid of losing my brother because he's in active addiction. I'm terrified of losing him and I'm reacting out of fear. And my sponsor tells me I have to clean this up. And I say, well, OK, he blocked me. And she said, well, text him for the next three days if he doesn't unblock you. You need to write him, you need to get his address, and then you need to write him a note. And I, I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't always listen to my sponsor. Um, but this time, this time I did. There was like this earnestness with him. He knew I had to do this. And uh, so for three days, I texted my brother the same thing. And he never unblocked me. And, um, so I, I texted his girlfriend, and I got his address, and I wrote a note. And I had to write it on a piece of paper this big because I didn't want my ego to get in the way. Like, well, I'm sorry, but, you know. And I, I wrote three sentences. Dear Benjamin, you did not deserve the way I spoke to you. Oh, I, I was wrong for the way I spoke to you. You did not deserve that. I love you very much. And two, two months later, he died. <laughs> January 20th, my brother died from this disease. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, right now, I, I'm, I, it is still very hard to see the gift in this. I love my brother so much. I miss my brother every second of every day, but I will tell you this. I got to show up for my mom and dad. I got to carry my baby brother on my lap, his ashes in my lap, and take him to the funeral, and I got to stand up in front of the room, and I got to eulogize my brother, and I got to honor him and his life. And I remember there was a... Oh, this is going to be bad, but I know it's going to be this bad. I knew there was... um. I, there was a, I had to fly somewhere to speak a couple weeks after he died, and I was, I was on the phone with my mom. And um, so when I made amends to my mother, you know, I asked my mom what I could do to make this right. And my mother told me, I need you to be a living example. I need you to be a living example of recovery to your little brother. And when I was on the phone with my mother, I asked her, I said, Mom, do you remember what you asked me to do when I made amends to you? And she said, I do. And I said, Mom, do you think I failed? <laughs> and I didn't know that my dad was, I was on speakerphone, and that my dad was in the car with her, and my, they both yelled out at the same time, no. And my dad said, absolutely not. And he said, in fact, everybody was shocked that I, 
he didn't get this after witnessing your transformation. See, here's the thing about a life beyond my wildest dreams. I'm in this life. I don't run from this life. I experience this life. I am a part of this life. This life that I ran from, this life that I hid from, it doesn't matter how deeply painful it is. It doesn't matter. I'm here in it, and this is a gift. Something I was incapable of experiencing when alcohol was my God. So I get this experience. And it's not all pain. On the, op on the other end of that pain is this joy. This joy that I, I can barely put into words. These relationships that I experience today that I never thought possible. I have a daughter, uh, you know, who has every right to hate my guts. And she is my best friend in the entire world. She's closer to me than any other person on this planet, including her father and the person, you know, who's, he's the one who raised her. And it's not because he's a bad guy. Like, in fact, I'm very close with my, uh, I'm close with my ex-husband and, you know, I'm part of their family. We celebrate holidays together. Like, that's part of the immense process. Like, we, we have this weird blended family and, uh, you know, but the thing about my relationship with my daughter is this. You guys taught me how to be a mother. Because before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, all I did was know how to have babies. I didn't know how to be a mother. I didn't know how to love anybody. And you guys taught me how to show up for this beautiful human being. And you taught me how to love her for who she is and how she is. Not try to change her or fix her or make her something different. And because of that, I am the safest person she knows. And you gave her her mother back. And I've had, I get to have this experience, you know. I, <laughs> I never believed that that was a possibility, not for someone like me, you know. I never believed that the relationships I would have with my family, you know, today, that, that my mother and my father would pick up the phone and they would call me and they would say, Sarah, you know, when Benjamin was alive, I can't even tell you how many phone calls I got from every single person in this family asking me what to do. And frankly, I had no idea. But what, my, what has happened with my life is that my life has started to bear witness to the power of Alcoholics Anonymous, that my family has witnessed this transformation, that my daughter has witnessed this transformation, that society has witnessed, like, I am employable today. Where I, <laughs> you know, I thought that was impossible. I, you know, the fact that I am a respected member of my community, the fact that I am a home, homeowner, all of these things, these are things that I never thought possible because you guys taught me how to be a part of life and not to run from it and how to live like, you know, an honest, decent person. I could get up here all day and talk about the big book and, uh, you know, I, I, somebody said it. I forget who it was. One of the speakers talked about, I could sit in a million big book studies and I could memorize this book cover to cover. I'm a pretty intelligent woman. And I, but it's, it's until these words become a living, breathing part of my life, I'm not actually experiencing Alcoholics Anonymous. Like, this has to be the way I live my life. It can't be in here. You know, my sponsor recently told me, because we've been doing a lot of really deep work, that I get stuck in these places where I want to worship the disciplines. I'm, you know, that's, I get stuck in worshiping the disciplines. And I get stuck in these places where, well, maybe if I just write more inventory, I'll feel better. Or, you know, maybe if I just go help more people, I'll feel better. It's always, always, always been about this relationship with God. The inventory is amazing because it, 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 it breaks me open so I can, I can experience that God. And, you know, working with others, this is the lifeblood of our program. I would be dead with about the women I sponsor. I can't even tell you what these women have done for me by sharing their hearts with me, by being a mirror to me reflecting me back to me, showing me where I need to do better and you know, I, I get this gift of watching their lives get transformed, watching them start to sponsor other women and start them, start to see them get set free. 
but I can get stuck on that too. I, I can still like use AA in this way where it's ego driven, where I'm running around like I, I, I'm in so much pain. Maybe if I sponsor a hundred women, I'll feel better. Maybe if I write 75 more pages of inventory, I'll feel better instead of just sitting with God and sitting in the pain and allowing it to be. And this is what was happening before I got here. You know, it's so funny, like, I can still seek relief in a million other ways because sitting with the grief of my brother's loss has been really unbearable some days. Some days I look at that grief and it feels like it's endless and I doubt God can do anything for me. So instead, like, let me go argue on Twitter real quickly. Let me go spend too much money on that purse. Let me hit up the toxic ex-boyfriend who can't stay sober. Let me go do that so I can feel better for two seconds. But I can't run from it. I come here this weekend and it's slammed in my face that I cannot run from this, that it's always going to be about God. It's always going to be about going back to that source. I can, I can have the outside look amazing and be suffering really bad inside and I, I have to be reminded all the time that I am not the power, that it, you know, that third step, I have to quit playing God. It didn't work. It, do, it just doesn't work. I am not going to be able to manage this, to figure out a way to make myself feel better, to avoid this grief. It's just going to have to happen, and I'm just going to have to, to, to trust God and Alcoholics Anonymous and you amazing people give me the permission to do that. And when I, and when I can do that, these relationships that I cherish and that I love that are so important to me, you know, they become deeper. I can love more deeply. I can be more present with the people I love because I'm not over here trying to figure out a way to avoid this. And this is what I needed to be reminded of this weekend, and I just didn't know it. I didn't know that I needed to be reminded that I can never run from this, and it always has to be going back to God. It always has to be going back to God. And, um, you know, when I do that and when I'm actively seeking God in these, you know, beautiful, you know, 11 step process, which is like, you know, I really do experience moments of peace and presence. I, it was funny. We were, we were praying and I was freaking out before I was coming in here. I was like, how am I going to do this? How am I going to speak in this mess, in this messy condition that I'm in? And, uh, you know, praying with friends and all of a sudden this really weird peace came over me. Like, overwhelming amount of peace and I, I almost freaked out because it's like wait why do I feel like this why am I so calm right now it's because for a few months now I've been I've been like holding on to all of this stuff like a tight ball and it like it wasn't until I went to a woman and I asked her to help me and I sat with my friends and I started to actually like surrender all of this that that peace came over me and it's a reminder too how comfortable I can get living in chaos how comfortable it gets living in fear. How comfortable that insanity in my head can get. Because when that piece hit me, I was like, wait, this isn't right. <laughs> I'm too calm. <laughs> but that's, that's the sweet spot. That's where I want to be. That's where I want to be. That's the life I, I you know, that's the life I want to live. And I, I'm, I'm realistic. I, I understand that I won't always get to be there. But I do know it's possible. One day at a time, I know it's possible. And, um... You know, and then I get to continue to live this beautiful life, and, um, and it really is a beautiful life. I talk about this all the time when I speak because I really think it's important. And um, I have a son that I haven't seen in, in 17 years. I lost custody of my son when he was six years old. And, you know, I had a court date set up, like I, I mentioned. And, uh, you know, I, I took a drink a day or so prior to this important meeting, and uh, I couldn't show up. And I lost custody. And um, when I was getting sober, um, you know, I was told to write a letter to his father and his stepmother, the woman who raised them, you know, to, uh, and to approach them about an amends, and they didn't want to hear what I have to say. And frankly, they still do not. And, um, and I've made direct approaches to my son, who is now an adult, and he wants nothing to do with me. And I remember it a few years sober, um, getting stuck in this place in my head where it was just like, I don't understand. I have, you know, I was three years sober. Like, why doesn't he want to talk to me? You know, 
I'm that farmer that came up from the cellar. Ain't a grand the wind stopped blowing because the torture I put this little boy through, frankly, it is a miracle he even survived having me as a mother. But on top of that, the emotional scars that I left him with when I was bouncing in and out of his life, you know, when he was so confused, you know, he's calling another woman mom and he doesn't know he's calling me mommy Sarah and all this. He has no idea who I even am or when I'm going to show up again. And, and at three years sober, I'm thinking, oh, I have a right. I have a right to this. I have a right to, like, I've earned this back somehow, and I'm getting confused, and I'm listening to people, you know, a lot of advice outside of, you know, in and out of AA, really well-meaning people who are like, well, you know, you never fully lost your rights, you know, you should get a lawyer, do this, and something happened, it has to be a power greater than me, because um, instead of doing what I want to do, and I'll tell you what I want to do. I want to, what I want to do today and any day is like I know where that boy lives. And what I want to do is I want to drive to his front door and I want to bang on his door and I want to tell him how much I love him and how sorry I am. <laughs> Instead of doing what I want to do. <laughs> In that moment, I did what the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous asks us to do and that is when we don't know what to do, we ask God for an intuitive thought or decision. And, I, and I'll tell you... Full disclosure, I suck at the next part, which is we relax and take it easy. Um, <laughs> I've never really gotten great at that. But I give this over to God, and I'm like, and I start begging God. I'm like, please, please, God, show me what to do. At this point, I hadn't seen my son in a decade. And I'm like, God, I don't even know what he looks like. Can you show me, please, what to do here? And then one night, I typed my son's name into Instagram, and I saw his face for the first time in a decade. <laughs> And he is beautiful, and he is happy, and he is loved. And then that peace center my heart, that peace that passes all understanding and that knowing that the restoration of this relationship is going to happen on God's time and not on mine. And then the longer I've stayed sober and the more work that I've done, the realization and the, and the knowing in my heart, thank you, is that this, rela this relationship may never be restored in the way I want it to be. But I know deep in my heart God's going to use this relationship for something. I just don't know what that is yet. And, uh, you know, I'm telling you that's not me because I come into Alcoholics Anonymous and I am absolutely convinced that the outside has to look okay for me to be okay inside. That was my firm belief. Like, I have to have all my ducks in a row in order for, for me to be okay. Like, I can't get and stay sober you know, if I don't have the relationship, if I don't have the car, if I don't have the job, if I don't have the marriage, I can't get and stay sober if somebody I love dies. <laughs> and I can't get and stay sober if I don't get my kids back. And it simply isn't true. My experience says otherwise, and the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous says otherwise. And, you know, one of my favorite lines in the big book, it says, you know, that we, we have to burn the idea into the consciousness, consciousness of every person that we can get well, regardless of anything. All we have to do is trust God and clean house. It doesn't even say sober. It says we get well. Because when I'm well from the inside out, a drink becomes irrelevant. I don't need it to treat me anymore. And if anything... It all comes out of my message, like my reliance on God and, I, you know, and, and, and my continued willingness to do the, this work is the only thing that has saved me from picking up a drink in the last 11 years. And, uh, and it's not because I'm special and it's not because I'm unique. I'm a low-bottom alcoholic. I am a real alcoholic of the hopeless variety. But I have a power greater than self, greater than alcohol. And I found that here in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I found that in that beautiful blue book. I found that in the action that's outlined in those steps. And I found that in the love of the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I found that through you. So you gave me my life back. You gave me my, you gave my daughter her mother back. You gave my family me back. I love you all, and I could never tell you how grateful I am for every single one of you. And that's all I have. Thank you.